The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnim Chapter 1 It began in a woman's club in London on a February afternoon. An uncomfortable club and a miserable afternoon. When Mrs Wilkins, who had come down from Hampstead to shop and had lunched at her club, took up the times from the table in the smoking room and running her listless eye down the agony column, saw this. To those who appreciate wisteria and sunshine, small, medieval Italian castle on the shores of the Mediterranean, to be let furnished for the month of April, necessary servants remain. Z, Box 1000, The Times. That was its conception. Yet, as in the case of many another, the conceiver was unaware of it at the moment. So entirely unaware was Mrs Wilkins that her April for that year had then and there been settled for her, that she dropped the newspaper with a gesture that was both irritated and resigned, and went over to the window, and stared drearily out at the dripping street. Not for her, were medieval castles, even those that are specially described as small. Not for her the shores in April of the Mediterranean, and the wisteria and sunshine. Such delights were only for the rich. Yet the advertisement had been addressed to persons who appreciate these things, so that it had been anyhow addressed too to her, for she certainly appreciated them, more than anybody knew more than she had ever told. But she was poor. In the whole world she possessed of her very own only ninety pounds, saved from year to year, put by carefully pound by pound out of her dress allowance. She had scraped this sum together at the suggestion of her husband as a shield and refuge against a rainy day. Her dress allowance, given her by her father, was one hundred pounds a year, so that Mrs. Wilkins's clothes were what her husband, urging her to save, called modest and becoming, and her acquaintance to each other, when they spoke of her at all, which was seldom, for she was very negligible, called a perfect sight. Mr. Wilkins, a solicitor, encouraged thrift, except that branch of it which got into his food. He did not call that thrift, he called it bad housekeeping. But for the thrift which, like moth, penetrated into Mrs. Wilkins's clothes and spoilt them, he had much praise. "'You never know,' he said, "'when there will be a rainy day, and you may be very glad to find you have a nest egg. Indeed we both may.' Looking out of the club window into Shaftesbury Avenue, hers was an economical club, but convenient for Hampstead where she lived, and for Shulbreds where she shopped. Mrs. Wilkins, having stood there some time very drearily, her mind's eye on the Mediterranean in April and the wisteria and the enviable opportunities of the ridge, while her bodily eye watched the really extremely horrible sooty rain falling steadily on the hurrying umbrellas and splashing omnibuses, suddenly wondered whether perhaps this was not the rainy day Malersh, Malersh was Mr. Wilkins, had so often encouraged her to prepare for and whether to get out of such a climate and into the small medieval castle wasn't perhaps what Providence had all along intended her to do with her savings. Part of her savings, of course. Perhaps quite a small part. The castle, being medieval, might also be dilapidated, and dilapidations were surely cheap. 
she wouldn't in the least mind a few of them, because you didn't pay for dilapidations which were already there. On the contrary, by reducing the price you had to pay, they really paid you. But what nonsense to think of it. She turned away from the window with the same gesture of mingled irritation and resignation with which she had laid down the times, and crossed the room towards the door with the intention of getting her Macintosh and umbrella, and fighting her way into one of the overcrowded omnibuses and going to Shulbreds on her way home, and buying some soles for Malersh's dinner. Malersh was difficult with fish and liked only soles except salmon. When she beheld Mrs. Arbuthnot, a woman she knew by sight as also living in Hampstead and belonging to the club, sitting at the table in the middle of the room on which the newspapers and magazines were kept, absorbed in her turn in the first page of the Times. Mrs. Wilkins had never yet spoken to Mrs. Arbuthnot, who belonged to one of the various church sets, and who analysed, classified, divided, and registered the poor, whereas she and Malersh, when they did go out, went to the parties of Impressionist painters of whom in Hampstead there were many. Malersh had a sister who had married one of them and lived up on the heath, and because of this alliance, Mrs. Wilkins was drawn into a circle which was highly unnatural to her, and she had learned to dread pictures. She had to say things about them, and she didn't know what to say. She used to murmur, Marvellous, and feel that it was not enough. But nobody minded, nobody listened, nobody took any notice of Mrs. Wilkins. She was the kind of person who is not noticed at parties. Her clothes, infested by thrift, made her practically invisible. Her face was non-arresting. Her conversation was reluctant. She was shy. And if one's clothes and face and conversation are all negligible, thought Mrs. Wilkins, who recognised her disabilities, what, at parties, is there left of one? Also, she was always with Wilkins, that clean-shaven, fine-looking man who gave a party, merely by coming to it, a great air. Wilkins was very respectable. He was known to be highly thought of by his senior partners. His sister's circle admired him. He pronounced adequately intelligent judgments on art and artists. He was pithy. He was prudent. He never said a word too much. Nor, on the other hand, did he ever say a word too little. He produced the impression of keeping copies of everything he said, and he was so obviously reliable that it often happened that people who met him at these parties became discontented with their own solicitors, and after a period of restlessness, extricated themselves and went to Wilkins. Naturally, Mrs. Wilkins was blotted out. She, said his sister, was something herself of the judicial, the digested and the final in her manner, should stay at home. But Wilkins could not leave his wife at home. He was a family solicitor, and all such have wives and show them. With his in the week he went to parties, and with his on Sundays he went to church. Being still fairly young, he was thirty-nine, and ambitious of old ladies of whom he had not yet acquired in his practice a sufficient number, he could not afford to miss church and it was there that Mrs. Wilkins became familiar, though never through words, with Mrs. Arbuthnot. She saw her marshalling the children of the poor into pews. She would come in at the head of the procession from the Sunday school exactly five minutes before the choir, and get her boys and girls neatly fitted into their allotted seats and down on their little knees in their preliminary prayer, and up again on their feet, just as to the swelling organ the vestry door opened, and the choir and clergy, big with the litanies and commandments they were presently to roll out, emerged. She had a sad face, yet she was evidently efficient. The combination used to make Mrs. Wilkins wonder, for she had been told by Malersh on days when they had only been able to get place, that if one were efficient, one wouldn't be depressed, and that if one does one's job well, one becomes automatically bright and brisk. About Mrs. Arbuthnot there was nothing bright and brisk, though much in her way with the Sunday school children that was automatic. But when Mrs. Wilkins, turning from the window, caught sight of her in the club, she was 
not being automatic at all, but was looking fixedly at one portion of the first page of the Times, holding the paper quite still, her eyes not moving. She was just staring, and her face, as usual, was the face of a patient and disappointed Madonna. Obeying an impulse she wondered at, even while obeying it, Mrs. Wilkins, the shy and the reluctant, instead of proceeding as she had intended to the cloakroom and from thence to Shulbred's in search of Malertia's fish, stopped at the table and sat down exactly opposite Mrs. Arbuthnot, to whom she had never yet spoken in her life. It was one of those long, narrow refectory tables so that they were quite close to each other. Mrs. Arbuthnot, however, did not look up. She continued to gaze, with her eyes that seemed to be dreaming, at one spot only of the times. Mrs. Wilkins watched her a minute, trying to screw up courage to speak to her. She wanted to ask her if she had seen the advertisement. She did not know why she wanted to ask her this, but she wanted to. How stupid not to be able to speak to her. She looked so kind. She looked so unhappy. Why couldn't two unhappy people refresh each other on their way through this dusty business of life by a little talk? Real, natural talk about what they felt, what they would have liked, what they still tried to hope. And she could not help thinking that Mrs. Arbuthnot, too, was reading that very same advertisement. Her eyes were on the very part of the paper. Was she, too, picturing what it would be like? The colour, the fragrance, the light, the soft lapping of the sea among little hot rocks? Colour, fragrance, light, sea instead of Shaftesbury Avenue and the wet omnibuses, and the fish department at Shulbreds, and the tube to Hampstead, and dinner, and tomorrow the same, the day after the same, and always the same. Suddenly Mrs. Wilkins found herself leaning across the table. "'Are you reading about the medieval castle and the wisteria?' she heard herself asking. Naturally, Mrs. Arbuthnot was surprised, but she was not half so much surprised as Mrs. Wilkins was at herself for asking. Mrs. Arbuthnot had not yet, to her knowledge, set eyes on the shabby, lank, loosely put-together figure sitting opposite her, with its small freckled face and big grey eyes almost disappearing under a smashed-down wet-weather hat, and she gazed at her a moment without answering. She was reading about the medieval castle and the wisteria, or rather had read about it ten minutes before, and since then had been lost in dreams, of light, of colour, of fragrance, of the soft lapping of the sea among little hot rocks. "'Why do you ask me that?' she said in her grave voice, for her training of and by the poor had made her grave and patient." Mrs. Wilkins flushed and looked excessively shy and frightened. "'Oh, only because I saw it too, and I thought perhaps... I thought somehow...' She stammered. Whereupon Mrs. Arbuthnot, her mind being used to getting people into lists and divisions from habit, considered, she gazed thoughtfully at Mrs. Wilkins. Under what heading, supposing she had to classify her, she could most properly be put... "'And I know you by sight,' went on Mrs. Wilkins, who, like all the shy, once she was started, plunged on, frightening herself to more and more speech by the sheer sound of what she had said last in her ears. "'Every Sunday. I see you every Sunday in church.' "'In church?' echoed Mrs. Arbuthnot. "'And this seems such a wonderful thing. This advertisement about the wisteria and... "'Mrs. Wilkins?' who must have been at least thirty, broke off and wriggled in her chair with the movement of an awkward and embarrassed schoolgirl. "'It seems so wonderful,' she went on in a kind of burst. "'And it is such a miserable day.' And then she sat looking at Mrs. Arbuthnot with the eyes of an imprisoned dog.' 
This poor thing, thought Mrs. Arbuthnot, whose life was spent in helping and alleviating, needs advice. She accordingly prepared herself patiently to give it. If you see me in church, she said, kindly and attentively, I suppose you live in Hampstead too. Oh yes, said Mrs. Wilkins, and she repeated, her head on its long, thin neck drooping a little as if the recollection of Hampstead bowed her. Oh yes. Where? asked Mrs. Arbuthnot, who, when advice was needed, naturally first proceeded to collect the facts. But Mrs. Wilkins, laying her hands softly and caressingly on the part of the times where the advertisement was, as though the mere printed words of it were precious, only said, Perhaps that's why this seems so wonderful. No, I think that's wonderful anyhow, said Mrs. Arbuthnot, forgetting facts and faintly sighing. Then you were reading it. Yes, said Mrs. Arbuthnot, her eyes going dreamy again. Wouldn't it be wonderful, murmured Mrs. Wilkins. Wonderful, said Mrs. Arbuthnot. Her face, which had lit up, faded into patience again. Very wonderful, she said. But it's no use wasting one's time thinking of such things. Oh, but it is, was Mrs. Wilkins' quick, surprising reply. Surprising because it was so much unlike the rest of her. The characterless coat and skirt, the crumpled hat, the undecided wisp of hair straggling out. And just the considering of them is worthwhile in itself. Such a change from Hampstead. And sometimes I believe, I, I really do believe, if one considers hard enough, one gets things. Mrs. Arbuthnot observed her patiently. In what category would she, supposing she had to, put her? Perhaps, she said, leaning forward a little, you will tell me your name. If we are to be friends, she smiled her grave smile, as I hope we are, we had better begin at the beginning. Oh yes, how kind of you. I'm Mrs. Wilkins, said Mrs. Wilkins. I don't expect, she added, flushing, as Mrs. Arbuthnot said nothing, that it conveys anything to you. Sometimes it... it doesn't seem to convey anything to me either. But... she looked round with a movement of seeking help. I am Mrs. Wilkins. She did not like her name. It was a mean, small name, with a kind of facetious twist, she thought, about its end like the upward curve of a pug-dog's tail. There it was, however. There was no doing anything with it. Wilkins she was, and Wilkins she would remain. And though her husband encouraged her to give it on all occasions as Mrs. Mellersh Wilkins, she only did that when he was within earshot, for she thought Mellersh made Wilkins worse, emphasising it in the way Chatsworth on the gateposts of a villa emphasises the villa. When first he suggested she should add Mellersh, she'd objected for the above reason, and after a pause, Mellersh was much too prudent to speak except after a pause, during which presumably he was taking a careful mental copy of his coming observation. He said, much displeased, But I am not a villa, and looked at her as he looks who hopes, for perhaps the hundredth time, that he may not have married a fool. Of course he was not a villa, Mrs. Wilkins assured him, she had never supposed he was. She had not dreamed of meaning. She was only just thinking. The more she explained, the more earnest became Mellersh's hope, familiar to him by this time, for he had been a husband for two years, that he might not by any chance have married a fool. And they had a prolonged quarrel. If that can be called a quarrel which is conducted with dignified silence on one side and earnest apology on the other, as to whether or no Mrs. Wilkins had intended to suggest that Mr. Wilkins 
was a villa. I believe, she had thought, when it was at last over, it took a long while, that anybody would quarrel about anything when they've not left off being together for a single day for two years. What we both need is a holiday. My husband, went on Mrs. Wilkins to Mrs. Arbuthnot, trying to throw some light on herself, is a solicitor. He... She cast about for something she could say elucidatory of Mellersh, and found... He's very handsome. Well, said Mrs. Arbuthnot kindly, that must be a great pleasure to you. Why? asked Mrs. Wilkins. Because, said Mrs. Arbuthnot, a little taken aback, for constant intercourse with the poor had accustomed her to have her pronouncements accepted without question. Because beauty, handsomeness, is a gift like any other. And if it is properly used... She trailed off into silence. Mrs. Wilkins's great grey eyes were fixed on her, and it seemed suddenly to Mrs. Arbuthnot that perhaps she was becoming crystallised into a habit of exposition, and of exposition after the manner of nursemaids, through having an audience that couldn't but agree, that would be afraid, if it wished, to interrupt, that didn't know that was, in fact, at her mercy. But Mrs. Wilkins was not listening. For just then, absurd as it seemed, a picture had flashed across her brain, and there were two figures in it, sitting together under a great trailing wisteria that stretched across the branches of a tree she didn't know. And it was herself and Mrs. Arbuthnot. She saw them. She saw them. And behind them, bright in sunshine, were old grey walls. The medieval castle. She saw it. They were there. She therefore stared at Mrs. Arbuthnot and did not hear a word she said. And Mrs. Arbuthnot stared too at Mrs. Wilkins, arrested by the expression on her face, which was swept by the excitement of what she saw and was as luminous and tremulous under it as water in sunlight when it is ruffled by a gust of wind. At this moment, if she had been at a party, Mrs. Wilkins would have been looked at with interest. They stared at each other. Mrs. Arbuthnot, surprised, inquiringly. Mrs. Wilkins with the eyes of someone who has had a revelation. Of course. That was how it could be done. She herself, she by herself, couldn't afford it, and wouldn't be able, even if she could afford it, to go there all alone. But she and Mrs. Arbuthnot together... She leaned across the table. Why don't we try and get it? She whispered. Mrs. Arbuthnot became even more wide-eyed. Get it? She repeated. Yes, said Mrs. Wilkins, still as though she were afraid of being overheard. Not just sit here and say how wonderful and then go home to Hampstead without having put out a finger. Go home, just as usual, and see about the dinner and the fish, just as we've been doing for years and years and will go on doing for years and years. In fact, said Mrs. Wilkins, flushing to the roots of her hair, for the sound of what she was saying, of what was coming pouring out, frightened her, and yet she couldn't stop. I see no end to it. There is no end to it. So that there ought to be a break. There ought to be intervals. In everybody's interests. Why, it would really be being unselfish to go away and be happy for a little, because we would come back so much nicer. You see, after a bit, everybody needs a holiday. But how do you mean, get it? asked Mrs. Arbuthnot. Take it, said Mrs. Wilkins. Take it? Rent it, hire it, have it. But do you mean you and I? Yes, between us. Share. Then it would only cost half. And you look so... You look exactly as if you wanted it just as much as I do. As if you ought to have a rest. 
have something happy happen to you. Why, but we don't know each other. But just think how well we would if we went away together for a month. And I've saved for a rainy day, and I expect so have you. And this is the rainy day. Look at it. She is unbalanced, thought Mrs. Arbuthnot. Yet she felt strangely stirred. Think of getting away for a whole month from everything to heaven. She shouldn't say things like that, thought Mrs. Arbuthnot. The vicar. Yet she felt strangely stirred. It would indeed be wonderful to have a rest. A cessation. Habit, however, steadied her again, and years of intercourse with the poor made her say, with the slight, though sympathetic superiority of the explainer, but then, you see, heaven isn't somewhere else. It is here and now. We are told so. She became very earnest, just as she did when trying patiently to help and enlighten the poor. Heaven is within us, she said in her gentle, low voice. We are told that on the very highest authority. And you know the lines about the kindred points, don't you? Oh, yes, I know them! interrupted Mrs. Wilkins impatiently. The kindred points of heaven and home, continued Mrs. Arbuthnot, who was used to finishing her sentences. Heaven is in our home. It isn't, said Mrs. Wilkins, again surprisingly. Mrs. Arbuthnot was taken aback. Then she said gently, Oh, but it is. It is there if we choose if we make it. I do choose, and I do make it, and it isn't, said Mrs. Wilkins. Then Mrs. Arbuthnot was silent, for she too sometimes had doubts about Holmes. She sat and looked uneasily at Mrs. Wilkins, feeling more and more the urgent need to getting her classified. If she could only classify Mrs. Wilkins, get her safely under her proper heading, she felt that she herself would regain her balance, which did seem very strangely to be slipping all to one side. For neither had she had a holiday for years, and the advertisement when she saw it had set her dreaming. And Mrs. Wilkins's excitement about it was infectious, and she had the sensation, as she listened to her impetuous, odd talk and watched her lit-up face, that she was being stirred out of sleep. Clearly, Mrs. Wilkins was unbalanced, but Mrs. Arbuthnot had met the unbalance before. Indeed, she was always meeting them, and they had no effect on her own stability at all. Whereas this one was making her feel quite wobbly, quite as though to be off and away, away from her compass points of God, husband, home and duty, she didn't feel as if Mrs. Wilkins intended Mr. Wilkins to come too, and just for once, be happy would be both good and desirable. Which, of course, it wasn't. Which certainly, of course, it wasn't. She also had a nest egg, invested gradually in the post office savings bank, but to suppose that she would ever forget her duty to the extent of drawing it out and spending it on herself was surely absurd. Surely she couldn't. She wouldn't ever do such a thing. Surely she wouldn't, she couldn't ever forget her poor, forget misery and sickness as completely as that. No doubt a trip to Italy would be extraordinarily delightful, but there were many delightful things one would like to do, and what was strength given to one for except to help one not to do them? Steadfast as the points of the compass to Mrs. Arbuthnot were the great four facts of life, God, husband, home, duty. She had gone to sleep on these facts years ago after a period of much misery, her head resting on them as on a pillow, and she had a great dread of being awakened out of so simple and untroublesome a condition. Therefore it was that she searched with earnestness for a heading under which to put Mrs. Wilkins, and this way illumine and steady her own mind. 
and sitting there looking at her uneasily after her last remark and feeling herself becoming more and more unbalanced and infected, she decided, pro tem, as the vicar said at meetings, to put her under the heading, nerves. It was just possible that she ought to go straight into the category hysteria, which was often only the antechamber to lunacy. But Mrs. Arbuthnot had learned not to hurry people into their final categories, having on more than one occasion discovered with dismay that she had made a mistake, and how difficult it had been to get them out again, and how crushed she had been with the most terrible remorse. Yes, nerves. Probably she had no regular work for others, thought Mrs. Arbuthnot. No work that would take her outside herself. Evidently she was rudderless, blown about by gusts, by impulses. Nerves was almost certainly her category, or would be quite soon if no one helped her. Poor little thing, thought Mrs. Arbuthnot, her own balance returning hand in hand with her compassion, and unable, because of the table, to see the length of Mrs. Wilkins's legs. All she saw was her small, eager, shy face and her thin shoulders, and the look of childish longing in her eyes for something that she was sure was going to make her happy. No, such things didn't make people happy, such fleeting things. Mrs. Arbuthnot had learned in her long life with Frederick, he was her husband, and she had married him at twenty and was now thirty-three, where alone true joys are to be found. They are to be found, she now knew, only in daily in hourly living for others. They are to be found only. Hadn't she over and over again taken her disappointments and discouragements there and come away comforted? At the feet of God. Frederick had been the kind of husband whose wife betakes herself early to the feet of God. From him to them had been a short, though painful, step. It seemed short to her in retrospect, but it had really taken the whole of the first year of their marriage, and every inch of the way had been a struggle, and every inch of it was stained, she felt at the time, with her heart's blood. All that was over now. She had long since found peace, and Frederick, from her passionately loved bridegroom, from her worshipped young husband, had become second only to God on her list of duties and forbearances. There he hung, the second in importance, a bloodless thing bled white by her prayers. For years she had been able to be happy only by forgetting happiness. She wanted to stay like that. She wanted to shut out everything that would remind her of beautiful things that might set her off again, longing, desiring. I'd like so much to be friends, she said earnestly. Won't you come and see me, or let me come to you sometimes? Whenever you feel as if you wanted to talk. I'll give you my address, she searched in her handbag, and then you won't forget. And she found a card and held it out. Mrs. Wilkins ignored the card. It's so funny, said Mrs. Wilkins, just as if she had not heard her. But I see us both, you and me, this April in the medieval castle. Mrs. Arbuthnot relapsed into uneasiness. Do you? she said, making an effort to stay balanced under the visionary gaze of the shining grey eyes. Do you? Don't you ever see things in a kind of flash before they happen? asked Mrs. Wilkins. Never, said Mrs. Arbuthnot. She tried to smile. She tried to smile the sympathetic yet wise and tolerant smile with which she was accustomed to listen to the necessarily biased and incomplete views of the poor. She didn't succeed. The smile trembled out. Of course, she said in a low voice, almost as if she were afraid the vicar and the savings bank were listening. It would be most beautiful. Most beautiful. Even if it were wrong, said Mrs. Wilkins, it would only be for a month. That, began Mrs. Arbuthnot, quite clear as to the reprehensibleness of such a point of view, but Mrs. Wilkins stopped her before she could finish. 
Anyhow, said Mrs. Wilkins, stopping her, I'm sure it's wrong to go on being good for too long till one gets miserable, and I can see you've been good for years and years because you look so unhappy. Mrs. Arbuthnot opened her mouth to protest. And I... I've done nothing but duties, things for the people, ever since I was a girl, and I don't believe anybody loves me a bit, a bit the better, and I long, oh, I long for something else, something else. Was she going to cry? Mrs. Arbuthnot became acutely uncomfortable and sympathetic. She hoped she wasn't going to cry, not there. Not in that unfriendly room with strangers coming and going. But Mrs. Wilkins, after tugging agitatedly at a handkerchief that wouldn't come out of her pocket, did succeed at last in merely apparently blowing her nose with it, and then, blinking her eyes very quickly once or twice, looked at Mrs. Arbuthnot with a quivering air of half-humble, half-frightened apology, and smiled. Will you believe? She whispered, trying to steady her mouth, evidently dreadfully ashamed of herself. That I've never spoken to anyone before in my life like this. I can't think. I, I simply don't know what has come over me. It's the advertisement, said Mrs. Arbuthnot, nodding gravely. Yes, said Mrs. Wilkins dabbing furtively at her eyes. And us both being so... <laughs> she blew her nose again a little. Miserable. Chapter 2 Of course, Mrs. Arbuthnot was not miserable. How could she be, she asked herself, when God was taking care of her. But she let that pass for the moment unrepudiated, because of her conviction that here was another fellow creature in urgent need of her help, and not just boots and blankets and better sanitary arrangements this time, but the more delicate help of comprehension, of finding the exact right words. The exact right words she presently discovered, after trying various ones about living for others and prayer, and the peace to be found in placing oneself unreservedly in God's hands. To meet all these words, Mrs. Wilkins had other words. Incoherent, and yet, for the moment at least, till one had had more time, difficult to answer. The exact right words were a suggestion that it would do no harm to answer the advertisement. Non-committal, mere inquiry, and what disturbed Mrs. Arbuthnot about this suggestion was that she did not make it solely to comfort Mrs. Wilkins. She made it because of her own strange longing for the medieval castle. This was very disturbing. There she was, accustomed to direct, to lead, to advise, to support, except Frederick, she long since had learned to leave Frederick to God, being led herself, being influenced and thrown off her feet by just an advertisement, by just an incoherent stranger. It was indeed disturbing. She failed to understand her sudden longing for what was, after all, self-indulgence, when for years no such desire had entered her heart. There's no harm in simply asking, she said in a low voice, as if the vicar and the savings bank and all her waiting and dependent poor were listening and condemning. It isn't as if it committed us to anything, said Mrs. Wilkins, also in a low voice, but her voice shook. They got up simultaneously. Mrs. Arbuthnot had a sensation of surprise that Mrs. Wilkins should be so tall, and went to a writing table, and Mrs. Arbuthnot wrote to Z. Box 1000 The Times for particulars. She asked for all particulars, but the only one they really wanted was the one about the rent. 
They both felt it was Mrs. Arbuthnot who ought to write the letter and do the business part. Not only was she used to organising and being practical, but she also was older and certainly calmer, and she herself had no doubt too that she was wiser. Neither had Mrs. Wilkins any doubt of this. The very way Mrs. Arthbuthnot parted her hair suggested a great calm that could only proceed from wisdom. But if she was wiser, older, and calmer, Mrs. Arbuthnot's new friend nevertheless seemed to her to be the one who impelled. Incoherent, she yet impelled. She appeared to have, apart from her need of help, an upsetting kind of character. She had a curious infectiousness. She led one on, and the way her unsteady mind leaped at conclusions, wrong ones, of course, witness the one that she, Mrs. Arbuthnot, was miserable. The way she leaped at conclusions was disconcerting. Whatever she was, however, and whatever her unsteadiness, Mrs. Arbuthnot found herself sharing her excitement and her longing, and when the letter had been posted in the letterbox in the hall and actually was beyond getting back again, both she and Mrs. Wilkins felt the same sense of guilt. It only shows, said Mrs. Wilkins in a whisper, as they turned away from the letterbox, how immaculately good we've been all our lives. The very first time we do anything our husbands don't know about, we feel guilty. I'm afraid I can't say I've been immaculately good, gently protested Mrs. Arbuthnot, a little uncomfortable at this fresh example of successful leaping at conclusions, for she had not said a word about her feeling of guilt. Oh, but I'm sure you have. I see you being good, and that's why you're not happy. She shouldn't say things like that, thought Mrs. Arbuthnot. I must try and help her not to. Aloud, she said gravely, I don't know why you insist that I'm not happy. When you know me better, I think you'll find that I am. And I'm sure you don't mean really that goodness, if one could attain it, makes one unhappy. Yes, I do, said Mrs. Wilkins. Our sort of goodness does. We have attained it, and we are unhappy. There are miserable sorts of goodness and happy sorts. The sort we'll have at the medieval castle, for instance, is the happy sort. That is, supposing we go there, said Mrs. Arbuthnot restrainingly. She felt that Mrs. Wilkins needed holding on to. After all, we've only written just to ask. Anybody may do that. I think it quite likely we shall find the conditions impossible. And even if they were not, probably by tomorrow we shall not want to go. I see us there, was Mrs. Wilkins' answer to that. All this was very unbalancing. Mrs. Arbuthnot, as she presently splashed through the dripping streets on her way to a meeting she was to speak at, was in an unusually disturbed condition of mind. She had, she hoped, shown herself very calm to Mrs. Wilkins, very practical and sober, concealing her own excitement, but she was really extraordinarily moved, and she felt happy, and she felt guilty, and she felt afraid, and she had all the feelings, though this she did not know, of a woman who has come away from a secret meeting with her lover. That indeed was what she looked like when she arrived late on her platform. She, the open-browed, looked almost furtive, as her eyes fell on the staring wooden faces waiting to hear her try and persuade them to contribute to the alleviation of the urgent needs of the Hampstead poor, each one convinced that they needed contributions themselves. She looked as though she were hiding something discreditable, but delightful. Certainly her customary, clear expression of candour was not there, and its place was taken by a kind of suppressed and frightened pleasedness which would have led a more worldly-minded audience to the instant conviction of recent and probably impassioned love-making. Beauty, 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 the words kept ringing in her ears as she stood on the platform talking of sad things to the sparsely attended meeting. She had never been to Italy, 
Was that really what her nest egg was to be spent on after all? Though she couldn't approve of the way Mrs. Wilkins was introducing the idea of predestination into her immediate future, just as if she had no choice, just as if to struggle or even to reflect were useless, it yet influenced her. Mrs. Wilkins' eyes had been the eyes of a seer. Some people were like that, Mrs. Arbuthnot knew, and if Mrs. Wilkins had actually seen her at the medieval castle, it did seem probable that struggling would be a waste of time. Still, to spend her nest egg on self-indulgence. The origin of this egg had been corrupt, but she had at least supposed its end was to be creditable. Was she to deflect it from its intended destination, which alone had appeared to justify her keeping it, and spend it on giving herself pleasure? Mrs. Arbuthnot spoke on and on, so much practised in the kind of speech that she could have said it all in her sleep, and at the end of the meeting, her eyes dazzled by her secret visions, she hardly noticed that nobody was moved in any way whatever, least of all in the way of contributions. But the vicar noticed. The vicar was disappointed. Usually his good friend and supporter, Mrs. Arbuthnot, succeeded better than this. And what was even more unusual, she appeared, he observed, not even to mind. "'I can't imagine,' he said to her as they parted, speaking irritably, for he was irritated both by the audience and by her, "'what these people are coming to. "'Nothing seems to move them.' "'Perhaps they need a holiday,' suggested Mrs. Arbuthnot. "'An unsatisfactory, a queer reply,' the vicar thought. "'In February?' he called after her sarcastically. "'Oh, no, not till April,' said Mrs. Arbuthnot over her shoulder. "'Very odd.' thought the vicar. Very odd indeed. And he went home and was not perhaps quite Christian to his wife. That night in her prayers, Mrs. Arbuthnot asked for guidance. She felt she ought really to ask, straight out and roundly, that the medieval castle should already have been taken by someone else, and the whole thing thus be settled. But her courage failed her. Suppose her prayer were to be answered? No, she couldn't ask it. She couldn't risk it. And after all, she almost pointed this out to God, if she spent her present nest egg on a holiday, she could quite soon accumulate another. Frederick pressed money on her, and it would only mean, while she rolled up a second egg, that for a time her contributions to the parish charities would be less and then it could be the next nest egg, whose original corruption would be purged away by the use to which it was finally put. For Mrs. Arbuthnot, who had no money of her own, was obliged to live on the proceeds of Frederick's activities, and her very nest egg was the fruit, posthumously ripened, of ancient sin. The way Frederick made his living was one of the standing distresses of her life. He wrote immensely popular memoirs, regularly, every year, of the mistresses of kings. There were in history numerous kings who had had mistresses, and there were still more numerous mistresses who had had kings, so that he had been able to publish a book of memoirs during each year of his married life, and even so there were great further piles of these ladies waiting to be dealt with. Mrs. Arbuthnot was helpless. Whether she liked it or not, she was obliged to live on the proceeds. He gave her a dreadful sofa once, after the success of his Du Barry memoir, with swollen cushions and soft receptive lap, and it seemed to her a miserable thing that there, in her very home, should flaunt this reincarnation of a dead old French sinner. Simply good, convinced that morality is the basis of happiness, the fact that she and Frederick should draw their sustenance from guilt, however much purged by the passage of centuries, was one of the secret reasons of her sadness. The more the memoired lady had forgotten herself, the more his book about her was read, and the more free-handed he was to his wife. And all that he gave her was spent 
after adding slightly to her nest egg, for she did hope and believe that some day people would cease to want to read of wickedness, and then Frederick would need supporting, on helping the poor. The parish flourished because, to take a handful at random, of the ill behaviour of the ladies Dubarry, Montespan, Pompadour, Ninon de Lenclos, and even of learned Maintenon. The poor were the filter through which the money was passed. To come out, Mrs. Arbuthnot hoped, purified. She could do no more. She had tried in days gone by to think the situation out, to discover the exact right course for her to take, but had found it, as she had found Frederick, too difficult, and had left it, as she had left Frederick, to God. Nothing of this money was spent on her house or dress. Those remained, except for the great soft sofa, or steer. It was the poor who profited. Their very boots were stout with sins. But how difficult it had been. Mrs. Arbuthnot, groping for guidance, prayed about it to exhaustion. Ought she perhaps to refuse to touch the money? to avoid it as she would have avoided the sins which were its source. But then what about the parish's boots? She asked the vicar what he thought, and through much delicate language, evasive and cautious, it did finally appear that he was for the boots. At least she had persuaded Frederick, when first he began his terrible, successful career, he had only began it after their marriage, when she married him, he had been a blameless official attached to the library of the British Museum to publish the memoirs under another name, so that she was not publicly branded. Hampstead read the books with glee and had no idea that their writer lived in its midst. Frederick was almost unknown, even by sight, in Hampstead. He never went to any of its gatherings. Whatever it was he did in the way of recreation was done in London, but he never spoke of what he did or whom he saw, he might have been perfectly friendless for any mention he ever made of friends to his wife. Only the vicar knew where the money for the parish came from, and he regarded it, he told Mrs. Arbuthnot, as a matter of honour not to mention it. And at least her little house was not haunted by the loose-lived ladies, for Frederick did his work away from home. He had two rooms near the British Museum, which was the scene of his exhumations, and there he went every morning and he came back long after his wife was asleep. Sometimes he did not come back at all. Sometimes she did not see him for several days together. Then he would suddenly appear at breakfast, having let himself in with the latchkey the night before, very jovial and good-natured and free-handed, and glad if she would allow him to give her something. A well-fed man, contented with the world. A jolly, full-blooded, satisfied man. And she was always gentle, and anxious that his coffee should be as he liked it. He seemed very happy. Life, she often thought, however much one tabulated, was yet a mystery. There were always some people it was impossible to place. Frederick was one of them. He didn't seem to bear the remotest resemblance to the original Frederick. He didn't seem to have the least need of any of the things he used to say were so important and beautiful. Love, home, complete communion of thoughts, complete immersion in each other's interests. After those early, painful attempts to hold him up to the point from which they had hand in hand so splendidly started, attempts in which she herself had got terribly hurt, and the Frederick she supposed she had married was mangled out of recognition. She hung him up finally by her bedside as the chief subject of her prayers, and left him, except for those, entirely to God. She had loved Frederick too deeply to be able now to do anything but pray for him. He had no idea that he never went out of the house without her blessing going with him too, hovering like a little echo of finished love round that once dear head. She didn't dare think of him as he used to be, 
as he had seemed to her to be in those marvellous first days of their lovemaking, of their marriage. Her child had died. She had nothing. Nobody of her own to lavish herself on. The poor became her children, and God the object of her love. What could be happier than such a life, she sometimes asked herself. But her face, and particularly her eyes, continued sad. Perhaps when we're old. Perhaps when we are both quite old. She would think wistfully. <laughs>